Hi friends, time for a new week with a new module. Today we will be beginning the discussion on uh, the third mode of heat transfer which we have so far not looked at. We had looked at the heat transfer mechanisms by conduction and by convection uh, and radiation. So conduction is a mechanism that happens in uh, stationary uh, objects through mechanisms of either lattice vibration or electron cloud motion or a combination of the two. Radiation is a mechanism by which energy is exchanged between objects that need not necessarily be separated by a material medium. And we also found that uh, in ordinary uh, objects that we look at every day, the transfer of energy happens by a combination of all three. One may be more predominant over the other under special circumstances. So today we will uh, look at the third mechanism and put all of those in perspective so that uh, we understand heat transfer as a whole and then embark on understanding convective heat transfer. So, convection per se is known to be a combination of conduction and fluid motion. That is, if I have a surface over which a fluid is flowing, the heat transfer from the surface to the fluid actually has to happen by conduction because when the fluid is flowing, the first layer of the fluid that is in contact with the surface is at the velocity of the surface and the relative velocity between the two is zero. So there is actually no motion of the fluid with reference to the surface. So the first layer of the fluid actually has to conduct the energy that goes from the solid to the fluid or from the fluid to the solid. And the remaining layers would probably take that energy away because of the movement. So you actually look at convective heat transfer, a heat transfer in which there is fluid motion as a combination of conduction and advection. We call that as advection. Okay. Let us uh, go to the whiteboard mode so that we can see. My face is not so much interesting to look at all the time may be more interesting to look at the whiteboard. Okay, so here we are. So convection can be looked upon as a combination of conduction plus what we call as advection. So as I said, if there is a, a solid surface and if there is a fluid moving on top of the solid surface, the heat transfer between these two would probably have to, let us say if the solid is at a higher temperature than the fluid, let us say this is Ts and uh, Tf, uh, let us say Ts is greater than Tf in this case. So then what happens? Energy from the solid is conducted through the solid to its surface and at the surface it is conducted from the solid to the fluid because the fluid layer at the surface is going to be stationary with reference to the solid surface because of no slip condition. Because of the presence of viscosity, the fluid that flows over a solid surface stick to, sticks to the solid surface and cannot move relative to the solid surface at the surface. But the layers immediately after that would start moving. So if I plot uh, the velocity, so let us say this is the velocity and this is the distance y from the uh, solid surface, then the velocity at the surface would be 0 with reference to the solid and after that there would be a gradual increase in velocity and far away from the solid the effect of the plate is forgotten and the fluid flows at its usual velocity, let us call it as u infinity which is the free stream velocity at y tends to infinity. So there is a certain velocity gradient 
that gets established near the surface because the surface itself has to have no slip condition that is the fluid does not slip at the surface because of the presence of viscosity there is no fluid which has zero viscosity there's always some viscosity even air for example which is one of the thinnest uh, possible fluids you know the fluids that has the least amount of viscous effect even that has a finite amount of viscosity and therefore when air flows over a surface at the surface the velocity of air would still be zero so no slip condition has to be respected and because of that the transfer of energy from the solid to the fluid in the first layer if let's hypothetically say this is the first layer it's actually an inflexible layer this has u is equal to zero so whatever energy that comes from the solid has to go through it has to get conducted through the first layer of the fluid so if minus k del t by del y at y equal to zero is the heat flux the energy transfer for per unit um, area this would be the heat transfer by q dot this is what would happen and this del t by del y would depend on the kind of flow that is present in this region and therefore the kind of velocity gradients that get established suppose this velocity is very large then you might have a velocity gradient which goes more like this a very sharp gradient here del u by del y but if the velocity is small like here then you might have this so the del u by del y would vary and accordingly the del t by del y would vary why would that vary because if i consider the next layer here the amount of energy that came here it does not stay here and get conducted but because this has a certain amount of velocity this ta is taken away and some fresh fluid comes here so this place is at a temperature which is lower than it was expected when the whole medium is stationary okay so then the temperature gradient across this first layer is more and therefore more heat is transferred and the more rapidly this repl replenishment happens the more this is closer to the ambient medium or the temperature t infinity if i might say that okay just kind of point u infinity there is a temperature t infinity or tf then this is closer to tf and therefore the amount of heat transfer would further increase okay so this del t by del y therefore is not a function only of the conduct conductivity of the medium but also a function which is dependent on the flow okay so this heat flux because of convection from a solid to the fluid is going to be dependent on the conductivity of the fluid this k is k of the fluid the first layer has the conductivity of the fluid kf okay and it also depends on del t by del y which is a function of the flow so the conduction which is k is going to affect it and advection which is going to determine del t by del y is also going to affect it so convection is therefore a combination of conduction and advection okay, so this is basically what we understand now the same argument will also apply when this inequality is reversed the heat transfer from the fluid to the solid will also depend on the conductivity of the material and the gradient of the temperature closer to the wall only thing is now the, uh, the fluid temperature would be higher than the solid temperature the rest of the argument remains the same okay so experimentally convection was observed by newton first so you have the newton's law of cooling where actually whenever there is a sub uh, surface t uh, there is a surface with the temperature t s and a fluid with a temperature let us say t infinity then what uh, newton observed is that the rate of heat transfer from here to here is proportional to the difference in temperature okay so uh, for the same kind of uh, flow conditions the temperature difference actually mattered so q dot is proportional to ts minus t infinity and he also found that it is proportional to 
the area. So he used a constant of proportionality called the heat transfer coefficient. So he said Q dot is equal to H into A into P S minus T infinity. And what he also recognized is that this H is not a constant, but it varies with the flow conditions that prevail here. Okay. So the more intense the flow is, higher the H, the less intense the flow is, lower the H. And so this H is therefore a property of the fluid as well as the flow. Now if I go back to the previous slide and make this equal to minus AF into A into del T by del Y at Y equal to 0, then you get the expression for uh, convection. So whatever energy that comes from the solid and goes to the fluid is actually equal to this. This also is written as this. So you can write this A would let's say get cancelled between the two and I can take the Ts minus T infinity to the other side. So this S H is going to be a function of Kf. Okay. So H is 0 when Kf is 0. This is one thing. So if there is no conduction in the uh, medium the conductivity of the medium is 0. There is no such substance whose conductivity is 0. But if the k is small, then the h would also be small. Okay. So if I have a poorly conducting fluid, then the heat transfer coefficient to that fluid would be smaller. And if I have a very good conducting fluid, kf is large, then the heat transfer coefficient also would be large. This is something that we all know. So that is the conduction part of it. And the delta by del y, as we understood in the previous part, is going to depend on the flow conditions. Okay, so therefore this H is a function of the fluid as well as the flow. Okay, so in convective heat transfer, our main idea or our main objective will be to quantify what this H is for various configurations, and that is the whole study of convective heat transfer. So in the uh, in studying conduction, we use this H quite frequently, saying that if there is conduction in the solid and there is a convection outside the surface of the solid, then we said at the surface what is conducted from the solid is equal to what is going out in the surface and we use exactly the same expression there. So basically now we are bringing that to formalism and now try, we will try to uh, get expressions by understanding the fluid flow how to get the value of H for different uh, cases. Okay. So let us understand what these cases might be. Okay. For example, suppose I have an automobile okay, and it is moving at a certain speed. So if I stand on the automobile and see then this is we are stationary with respect to the automobile so this velocity is not what we feel but what we would feel is that the surrounding atmosphere is moving against us at a certain speed. Okay, Because of that there is a certain kind of flow pattern that gets set around the automobile and because of that if this for example in hot summer this air is at let us say t is equal to 40 degrees celsius then this actually has a lot of heat transfer that happens from the surrounding air because of convection into the vehicle. So this is one example of a flow condition. So this is flow over a surface. Not only this, if I just look at the momentum part of it, not, not the heat transfer but the momentum part of it, this phenomenon is also responsible for the drag because of aerodynamics and that results in resistance to the movement of the vehicle and the reason why you need to uh, spend fuel is because there is friction at the ground and there is friction with respect to these fluid and that creates a drag which one needs to overcome and that is why you need to run the engine all the time. So that is uh, one of the reasons for the petroleum crisis, right? so aerodynamic drag. So this is the momentum transfer from the surrounding air to the vehicle and the heat transfer from the surrounding air to the vehicle is responsible for heating up of the vehicle which results in requirement of more of air conditioning cooling in summer. So this is one example of heat transfer. Another example is, um, so this is an external flow. Another example is let us say an internal flow. So there is flow of let us say steam happening through a pipe 
and this steam pipe is kept in the surroundings whose temperature is T infinity and there is a solid wall that's there in between. Then this steam is at a higher temperature Ts and the, the T infinity is smaller. So there is convection from the steam to this surface and then there is conduction through this surface and there is convection from this to the other. We have looked at that in the conduction heat transfer. So you have a Ts and you have a convective resistance to T uh, W1, let us say this is the water temperature. So there is a temperature T wall 1 on the inside and T wall 2 on the outside. And then you have the wall conductivity. So there is a T wall 2 and then there is a resistance to the surroundings. So this we said is 1 over Hi Ai and this is 1 over Ho Ao where Hi and Ho are the heat transfer coefficients on the inner and outer surfaces. Ai and Ao are the inner and outer areas and this one we wrote it using the uh, cylindrical coordinates uh, expression. So log of R2 by R1 by 2 pi L k where L is the length of the pipe, R2 and R1 are the inner and outer radii of the pipe and so on. So this is the resistance module that we wrote. In this the Hi is because of the convection between the steam uh, flowing inside the pipe and the wall of the pipe. There, because there is a temperature difference between Ts and Tw1, there is a heat transfer there and that is given by this uh, Hi and that Hi would depend on the flow conditions that prevail inside the uh, pipe, how much velocity is steam going at, what is the conductivity of steam and what is the rate at which that uh, rate of heat transfer happens from the surface of the, 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 the steam to the surface of the tube on the inner side. Okay. Similarly, on the outer side, depending on the kind of conditions that prevail, if there is wind blowing on the outside of the pipe, then there is a higher rate of heat transfer because this H0 increases. But if there is a stationary atmosphere, the air is not moving much, then this H0 is smaller and therefore there is not much happening there. Suppose this whole thing is immersed in water instead of air, then the conductivity of water is substantially higher than the conductivity of air and therefore even in stationary water, the H0 would be much higher as compared to in stationary air. And if the water is also flowing or moving on the outside, then the H0 would further increase because of the fluid motion that is happening on the outside and so on. So these are various scenarios in which convective heat transfer actually happens. In nature, a lot of uh, convective heat transfer happens. Much of the atmospheric phenomena are because of convection. Right? The sunshine heats up the floor of the ground, the, the ground of the earth, the surface of the earth, because of which the earth's surface gets warmer than the air that is uh, standing above it. So there is heat transfer from the surface of the earth to the air. The air in contact with the earth's surface gets warmer than the air which is higher in the atmosphere. Now, because of higher temperature, this air is lighter so it goes up and along with it it carries all the moisture that evaporated from the ground surface and it goes up into the upper reaches of the atmosphere and there the temperatures are lower and therefore this uh, water vapor which went up there starts condensing onto the uh, particulates that are there in the atmosphere and becomes a cloud. Okay? So you have clouds formation and precipitation happening because of this, this is a convective phenomenon. And this convection is not local, but there is also along the ground movement. So if I have a seashore, the land gets warmer during the day as compared to the sea and therefore the air on the top of the land rises, the water, the air from the sea rushes in in order to uh, make up that and there is a circulation between land and the sea. And when the air from the sea comes, it brings along with it the water vapor that is evaporated from the sea surface and then contributes to the atmospheric phenomena. So all monsoons, all uh, trade winds, all uh, uh, rainfall and everything that happens in the atmosphere are phenomena because of a combination of solar radiation and convection. Right? And not to mention of course the role of conduction in the convective phenomena. An interesting phenomenon of uh, uh, convection, uh, in uh, nature much of the convection happens because of natural uh, sources because of density differences that are created because of solar radiation, heating, cooling. 
So one of the interesting phenomena is our uh, main building's uh, wind tunnel. Okay. So suppose this is your main building and at the bottom you have this wind tunnel region. Okay. So the main building actually faces east on this side and west on this side. So in the forenoon the sun is on this side. Okay. So this side of the main building gets sunshine and becomes warmer and therefore the air which is adjacent to it gets warmer and starts rising. Okay. So when that happens this side is still cool so there is a movement of air from here and that takes the uh, atmosphere, okay, atmosphere the, uh, the natural convection that happens because of the heating of the vertical wall takes the air up on this side by taking air from this and that results in movement of air inside the winter. And what happens in the afternoon? The sun moves away from here to the other side, right? So the sun is now here, and now this wall of the building gets warmer, and therefore there is upward movement here. So all what was happening in the morning is now undone. This is not happening anymore. But now the air movement is happening in the opposite direction. So the air movement is now happening here like this. So there is movement of air in the opposite direction through this. So this region of um, the uh, main building's porch, the wind tunnel, gets breeze practically throughout the day and throughout the night. At night, these buildings cool down, okay, and because of that, the surrounding air might still be warmer and there may be a downward movement of uh, this one. Still, the western wall is warmer than the uh, eastern wall, so there is some movement in one direction. And uh, that air movement keeps continuously happening. So the wind tunnel practically has movement of air throughout the day and throughout the nights. So that's the reason why it's called a wind tunnel. Although it was not intended to be a wind tunnel, a wind tunnel is normally a controlled uh, passage of air in which you test uh, objects for uh, various fluid mechanic properties like drag or lift and various things. For example, if you want to test an airplane wing, or as to how much uh, lift it has, you put it inside a tunnel where you fix it at a certain angle and you have the wind blowing over it. So there will be a certain amount of force that is exerted by this. There is a flow separation here. So there is a net force of the wind that happens this way which causes what is called the lift. Okay, And there is a certain force because of uh, the flow along the, uh, the wing and that causes the drag. So you can actually fit this on um, uh, probes which can measure the forces in both directions so that you can get the lift and the drag on uh, this for various angles of attack. So this theta is called the angle of attack of this stream onto the uh, wing. And so for various angles of attack and for various velocities of uh, this for a given wing span you try to uh, measure what is the lift force and the drag force and that is an aerodynamic characteristic of the wing that you use. So this is normally called the wind tunnel where you actually deliberately blow controlled amounts of wind in order to test uh, equipment and this wind tunnel is uh, nice design by the architects for uh, people to just sit underneath and uh, enjoy the natural breeze irrespective of the time of the season. Right? Uh, so that is uh, an interesting application of uh, convective heat transfer. Now, um, I said that uh, the quantity of interest in convective heat transfer is the heat transfer coefficient h which is a function of the fluid properties and the flow properties. Okay. So the fluid properties because as I mentioned uh, irrespective of uh, whether there is motion or not the conductivity of the fluid uh, plays, plays an important role in uh, this. In addition to the conductivity the other properties of the flow uh, other properties of the fluid such as the viscosity, the specific heat, the density, all of these play a role in uh, determining the kind of flow patterns that happen around it and therefore the fluid properties uh, K rho 
C mu all of these C maybe C P mu all of these properties uh, affect the heat transfer coefficient so it is a property of the fluid so if I use water in place of air or a liquid metal in place of uh, air or uh, an oil in place of air the uh, kind of uh, the phenomena that you get will be very different because the fluid properties are different right in addition to that it also depends on the flow properties okay so the flow properties would basically uh, be characterized by whether the flow is um, at low speed or high speed whether the velocity gradients are high or low whether the uh, flow is turbulent or laminar whether the flow is a single phase or a multi-phase flow in the sense that is there an evaporation or a condensation happening at the surface so all of these determine the flow properties so for a given and it also depends on the geometry the flow uh, depends on the geometry so we actually looked at um, the example of uh, an airfoil in a wind tunnel where the geometry is in some sense a streamlined body so if I have uh, airflow that is coming here it flows over it reasonably smoothly without uh, much of an irritation but suppose I have a blunt bus that's coming here okay and that's uh, airflow here the airflow will have to jump here and therefore there is a recirculation that happens here the airflow will have to jump underneath there's a recirculation here and uh, so this is a non aerodynamic body because of which the flow shows a lot of uh, 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 non smooth uh, behavior because of which the drag force that this airflow will have on the bus will be substantially more and that's the reason why most uh, automobiles these days are shaped more like this so your automobile uh, shape would try to ensure that the amount of drag that happens because of the flow over it is minimized and you have a reasonably streamlined flow over the automobiles to the extent that you can so this is something which uh, is determined by the geometry so you can make a body a streamlined body okay where uh, flow going over it would not uh, have separations of flow like this and uh, eddies and recirculations that get created but you have streamlined flow because of which there is less drag or you can have a bluff body which is not streamlined the opposite of streamlined is a bluff body and there is flow separation and various things happen because of that so much of uh, the phenomena that happen with uh, atmospheric conditions and the cricket ball for example are phenomena of non streamlined body because the ball is not a streamlined body it is just a sphere so it's a bluff body so the flow go over it, goes over it will separate here and there are eddies that uh, get formed here and the ball also is not a smooth sphere but it has the seam okay so because of the seam and the position of the seam and the angle at which the seam is maintained the drag on the two sides of the ball would be different and accordingly the ball would be swinging this way or this way when it is going in a direction which is perpendicular to the plane of the ball and therefore you get swingers of the ball which come into the right handed batsman or going going out of the right handed batsman and so on so these lateral movements of the ball come because of the non streamlined motion of air over the uh, the cricket ball so this is another uh, example of the flow drag happening over a cricket ball which is again a fluid property or a flow property just like the heat transfer coefficient the drag or the lift are phenomena of fluid mechanics that happen over a, a cricket ball and they result in the various effects and they you also have effects of the spin of the ball okay so uh, whether it's a fast bowler or a uh, spin bowler the rotations that the bowler gives the ball matters as to whether the ball will experience a downward or an upward force um, and depending on that you get dippers or you get uh, balls that which are floaters so you might get various kinds of things you get what is called the swing as well as you got you get what is called the robin effect those of you who play table, table tennis would have noticed this a lot more you give more spin to the ball 
then the way the ball moves and the amount of force that uh, the surrounding air is able to exert on it other than the f force that is exerted on the ball by your racket would uh, cause additional phenomena to happen to the table tennis ball. So these are all fluid mechanic phenomena that happen on a ball. Okay. So the uh, momentum transfer between the fluid and the uh, air around uh, is a phenomenon which is very similar to the heat transfer and that's why I'm mentioning both of these simultaneously and the flow properties affecting uh, heat transfer and the flow properties affecting momentum transfer happen in very similar fashions. Okay. So that is one of the reasons why I'm mentioning fluid mechanics and heat transfer simultaneously and in studying convective heat transfer you cannot separate fluid mechanics from heat transfer but you always connect fluid mechanics and heat transfer together. Okay. So that's how you study. So, um, if I still talk about the heat transfer coefficient h, so on a given surface, um, for example, if there is an airflow, so this let us say this is a bus on top of which there is airflow from uh, surroundings. So the airflow would uh, actually establish a small region on the uh, surface of the bus, okay, which is affected by the uh, the presence of the uh, bus uh, walls or bus roof and uh, a region away from it which is not affected. So here if the velocity is uniform for uh, because the bus is moving at some constant speed the relative velocity of the air over it is uniform at a distance away from it the velocities will go down to zero at the surface of the bus and therefore there is a region which is affected and this region gets thicker and thicker as I move away, uh, as I move further downstream. So this layer is quite frequently called the boundary layer. Okay, and this boundary layer is uh, an imaginary layer or the like a line that I draw imaginarily uh, over the region which is having velocities less than the free stream velocity. And similarly, if there is heat transfer temperatures which are different from the free stream temperature. So if let us say the bus is colder and the surrounding is warmer, so you have the uh, bus temperature is lower, so you might have something which comes, uh, come to, comes to the bus surface like this. So this is let us say T surface and let us say this is T infinity. Okay, So this is the region which is affected by the presence of the bus, the uh, temperature of the uh, air is affected by the presence of the bus and otherwise it is not affected. So you re you have a region called the boundary layer which is um, uh, adjacent to the surface. Normally the thickness of this is of the order of a few millimeters. I have drawn it large in order to uh, show it to you clearly. So the uh, variation of uh, temperature or uh, velocity will happen over a small region close to the surface uh, because of which there is drag or there is uh, heat transfer. Okay. So that is uh, uh, what we look at. So this is one of the cases where there is a flow which is happening and that is happening because of the movement of the bus relative to the air stream. So this is forced by the movement of the bus. In the other example that I took of the wind tunnel, the air movement was because of the density gradients created by the heating or cooling because of the solar radiation. So that is natural. So you have forced flow versus natural flow. Okay. So the convection that is happening because of forced flow is called forced convection and the convection that is happening because of natural flow is called natural convection. So this is one kind of classification of the flow situations. The flow that is happening because of forcing, the flow that is happening because of natural, natural means. So if you have uh, the example of the steam pipe then the flow is forced of course because the steam is forced through the pipe by a compressor or a high pressure uh, uh, water flow or whatever it is. So there is a pressure gradient that is driving the fluid flow which is created by machinery that are used for creating that pressure difference. So that is a forced flow. Natural flow is where the temperature differences or the density differences that uh, are caused by natural phenomena are causing the flow to happen. Okay, so that is one classification. The other classification of the sources of the flow, uh, one would be laminar versus turbulent. 
this is something which uh, might be part of your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, experience so if I uh, open the uh, bathroom sink tap or the kitchen sink tap okay so when I open it very slightly then you get a stream which is reasonably well behaved okay it's smooth then it falls here and then jumps off like that and if uh, I'll find that when I increase the flow rate there is a smooth flow until a certain distance after which the flow is disturbed okay and when I increase the flow velocity further then the whole thing is disturbed okay so this is basically the practical observation of laminar and uh, turbulent flow similarly if I have uh, a pipe inside which the flow is going at a small velocity then you will have layers of the fluid which have different velocities from each other so there will be a smooth velocity profile that happens here and if I inject some dye here okay so now uh, suppose um, I inject a, a dye here okay the dye will just go in a streak like a straight line here for a long distance before it disperses off okay so this kind of a flow is a laminar flow okay so if I inject the dye at this location it will uh, if I inject a dye at this location it will follow that location if I inject a dye at this location it will follow that location without mixing so this kind of a flow is normally called the laminar flow where the flow is happening in organized layers one above the other and they are not intermixing that quickly it takes a long time before these get disturbed and the mixing happens okay um, okay so if um, the flow uh, velocities are much higher in the same uh, pipe then what happens the layers of the lamina are may come mixed with each other because of there are eddy formations inside so the uh, flow is not uh, smooth so in that case if I inject a dye uh, let us say okay the same colored dye uh, suppose I inject it here suppose I inject it from here then you see that the dye gets dispersed into the medium and disappears within a very very short distance now this uh, flow is the turbulent flow okay whereas this flow is a laminar flow so when the flow is smoothly flowing in layers it's a laminar flow and when the smooth layers are disturbed and there is intermixing between the layers happening then the flow is turbulent okay now uh, all natural flows are by nature turbulent because there are disturbances that get introduced into the flow and those disturbances uh, magnify themselves and uh, you know, the flow becomes turbulent very quickly only at very very low velocities where the viscosity of the flow is able to kill those oscillations so if I for example uh, have this uh, laminar flow happening in the pipe and I just tap the pipe a little bit by my hand then there will be some oscillations some vibrations happening which will start some mixing happening here but after that the viscosity of the flow if the flow is slow enough the viscosity is able to kill those oscillations and the flow becomes smooth again and it becomes laminar again okay but uh, under circle okay, if, if gradually increase the velocity and at every velocity just do a tap at some velocity the tap would result in the flow completely becoming into turbulent and uh, would not return to laminar that easily at all so then you have actually crossed a uh, stability limit of the flow so there is a uh, uh, inherent uh, issue of stability and instability of the flow if I disturb the flow if it is able to come back to the smoothness then it is a reasonably stable uh, situation then the flow will remain laminar but otherwise it becomes turbulent and there are two uh, mechanisms that are uh, uh, happening here one is the flow velocity which has to do with the inertia of the flow okay and uh, the other is the viscosity 
Okay. So if I compare the inertia effects and the viscous effects, whenever the viscous effects are dominant, then the flow can remain laminar and the inertia effects are dominant, the flow becomes turbulent. So you have a non-dimensional number which is the ratio of these two, inertia by viscous forces and this we call it as the Reynolds number. So if the Reynolds number is low, the flow remains laminar and if the Reynolds number is higher, it becomes turbulent and there is a transitional region over which the flow transitions from laminar to turbulent and the value of Reynolds number at which the transition would happen and the way it is defined would differ from situation to situation. But there is always a certain critical Reynolds number below which the flow can remain laminar and above which it enters transition and becomes turbulent. Okay? So for flow through a pipe in single phase flow, the uh, critical Reynolds number is about 2300. So this is defined in terms of the properties of the fluid and the diameter of the pipe and so on. Okay. So uh, if the Reynolds number is less than 2300, it remains laminar and if it is greater than 2300, it becomes turbulent. So that is uh, another thing. So one is natural versus forced flow, the other is laminar versus turbulent flow. Of course, there can be intermix of this, that is you can have natural um, laminar flow, you can have natural turbulent flow, you can have uh, forced laminar flow, you can have forced turbulent flow. Okay? So these can happen, but this is two different independent ways of classifying it. Similarly, you can also have single phase and multi phase flow. or phase change flow let us say. So if I have for example a pipe inside which uh, uh, a refrigerant is flowing let us say okay, in the evaporator of uh, uh, an air conditioner or refrigerator or in the condenser of an air conditioner or refrigerator. So initially let us say in the condenser vapor is coming and this is losing heat to the surroundings and it starts condensing and as it goes on the liquid content increases and finally you will have the entire thing filled with liquid. So this is a case where there is phase change happening in the flow and because of the phase change the heat transfer rates would be substantially higher because the latent heat required for uh, condensation or evaporation, the latent heat released by condensation or the latent heat absorbed by evaporation will also add to the heat transfer rates and therefore phase change heat transfers normally have a much higher uh, heat transfer coefficient as compared to single phase flows and that is one of the reasons why uh, it is preferred to use phase change flows whenever the requirement of uh, uh, heat transfer coefficients for a given situation are very high. Say for example if I need to remove uh, heat at a very rapid rate then I would normally prefer to use uh, uh, phase change flow as compared to a single phase flow. Okay. So even in a single phase flow if I am using a low conductivity fluid such as air the heat transfer coefficients would be lower but if I use uh, substances that are such as water or liquid metals whose conductivities are higher than that of air I would be able to increase the heat transfer coefficients. So you uh, choose the material and the flow situation corresponding to the kind of heat transfer coefficients that you may require from case to case. So this is uh, an introduction. So we understand that uh, convective heat transfer is a combination of uh, heat conduction and uh, flow and uh, heat conduction uh, in fluids would be low or high depending on the conductivity of the fluid and the flow situations would normally enhance the heat transfer. So the number of times the heat transfer gets enhanced because of the flow is another non-dimensional number. So I call that the result number. Okay. So this is heat transfer with convection divided by heat transfer in pure conduction. That is if I have a surface of a uh, solid on which there is uh, fluid and the fluid is stationary and there is heat transfer, then the heat transfer in the fluid will, can, will be because of pure conduction. And if I start moving the fluid, then the heat transfer coefficient would increase. So the number of times by which the heat transfer coefficient increases is defined as 
the nuisance number. So, in uh, uh, this, uh, if I call this as h into uh, a into t s minus t infinity, and this pure in pure conduction, it will be k times a times t s minus t infinity divided by some characteristic length. Okay. So, this would be the ratio. So, if I cancel out this a and this t s minus t infinity, then I get h l c by k. Now, this is the uh, definition of what I call as the Nusselt number and this is a non-dimensional number because the units of this is watts per meter square Kelvin, this is meter and this is watts per meter Kelvin. So, when they get cancelled out, you get a non-dimensional number. So, the Nusselt number is nothing but the number of times the heat transfer is enhanced because of the presence of fluid motion. Okay. And we also talked about the Reynolds number which is the ratio of the inertial force to the viscous force and uh, the fluid motion can be characterized by the Reynolds number in the case of a forced flow. So, the Reynolds number is representative of the flow conditions and the fluid properties are often described by what is called the Prandtl number particularly with reference to heat transfer. The Prandtl number is nothing but um, the ratio of uh, nu and alpha, where nu is the kinematic viscosity, which is defined as uh, the dynamic viscosity mu divided by rho. We will uh, talk about this a little bit more, but it also has the units of meter square per second. So, we could call it the diffusivity of momentum and this alpha is the diffusivity of uh, thermal diffusivity which is k by rho cp we defined earlier. So, this ratio is the Prandtl number which represents the fluid properties as I told you the viscosity, density, uh, this alpha is uh, k over rho c. So, this conductivity and uh, specific heat. So, this whole thing actually becomes equal to uh, mu c by k. this is your uh, Prandtl number, this is another non-dimensional number which stands for the properties of the fluid. So, normally the Nusselt number is expressed as a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number in most common cases. Okay. So, this is a non-dimensional way of saying that the heat transfer in convection is a function of the fluid property and the flow. Okay. The flow is represented by the Reynolds number, the fluid properties are represented by the frontal number and the heat transfer by convection is represented by the number of times heat transfer gets enhanced because of fluid motion that is the number. Okay. So, we will uh, talk about all of these things in more detail in the next lectures. This was a nutshell introduction from a broad perspective to get you initiated into thinking about convection. So, in order to understand convection, I said that uh, we will need to study what is called the heat transfer coefficient and the heat transfer coefficient itself we defined it as uh, yeah we defined it as uh, the temperature gradient okay uh, divided by T s minus T infinity multiplied by K f. Now, T s and T infinity are fixed boundary conditions for the given problem, but the del T by del y uh, needs to come from the understanding of how temperature varies here. So, it will have to come from the solution of some differential equation that is ha that has its origin from conservation of energy. So, we will need to solve the energy equation in order to get that. So, how do you get that energy equation? What does that energy equation depend on? And what are the equations that govern uh, fluid motion that controls the heat transfer is something that we will need to know. So, by solving all of that or by making measurements in the field, if I can get the del T by del Y, then I will be able to quantify H. So, you have experimental methods of quantifying heat transfer, you have uh, uh, mathematical methods of quantifying the heat transfer coefficient in convection. So, we will understand all of these in a uh, comprehensive way as we go on. So, in the next class, we will discuss a little bit about connecting the uh, open system equations that we derived in uh, first, uh, the first and second laws of thermodynamics and conservation of mass. 
with uh, a mathematical uh, way of doing it for fluid mechanics, what we call as the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, so we uh, did the control volume analysis in uh, thermodynamics rather informally. So a little bit more uh, rigorous and formal mathematics will go into it in order to formalize it in the form of formal conservation equations of mass and energy. We will also introduce the other variables like momentum, angular momentum, etc. to define the general, general form of the conservation equations. And from those general form of the conservation equations, write the equations that govern convective heat transfer. We will also talk about uh, the analogy between heat transfer, mass transfer and momentum transfer because of which these uh, sciences can be studied in a more uh, uh, related way. So the results from one uh, part of the science can be utilized to understand another part of the science. So, uh, we will uh, come to the close of uh, today's presentation at this location. Those, today's presentation was primarily a broad overview and we will go into specifics from the next lecture onwards. We will understand the Reynolds transport theorem and the governing equations of conservation of mass, momentum, energy in a differential form and then using that uh, and using the various uh, simplifications that can be applied to that, how do we get solutions under various situations. We will then talk about situations of external flow and internal flow and try to get some broad uh, understanding of the characteristics of this kind of flow and therefore convection in such geometries. So today we will uh, stop at this location and uh, uh, I will uh, in the Moodle page open one more thread for doubts on convective heat transfer where you can post your uh, doubts and difficulties and I will respond. And uh, I don't know how many of you are actually following the lectures and uh, tutorial sheets appropriately. It looks like the uh, lockdown period might extend a little further and this can be used as a nice opportunity to uh, uh, learn things from a more fundamental and philosophical perspective rather than from the examination perspective. Um, for all you know this semester uh, examinations and evaluations may not really happen so probably that's the way you would like it to be. So please do it the way you like it, right? So let's uh, stop it at this point and we'll meet again in the next class.